Friday, and I really, really know that on a Friday afternoon there are usually many other things to do, so I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate your interest. Um, you have heard that I have lived in your beautiful country for, well, I'm in my 24th year, having served both at the UN and now in Washington. And it's very unusual for a government to keep uh, the ambassador for that long. Uh, usually after four years, at the very latest, uh, a rotation takes place and the ambassador goes to another assignment. Because most governments believe that after four years the ambassador goes native, and that is not, <laughs> that is not always good for the bilateral relations. But in our case, uh, we have a very small foreign service. The, to the total number of Liechtenstein diplomats is around 30, and we have eight diplomatic uh, representations, so you can imagine we cannot possibly uh, allow ourselves to rotate every four years. I am standing before you as the representative of a country, uh, since I know you are all very gender sensitive, that introduced the right for women to vote and to stand for election in 1984. Not 1884, 1984. So we have come a long way within a reasonably short time. Since 1984, women in Liechtenstein have done quite a bit to expedite themselves into leadership positions, but there is room for improvement. In those years, we have had now one female deputy prime minister, we've had three female foreign ministers, and various uh, female leaders on a community level. And in our parliament of 25, presently we have five female deputies. I'm very proud to say that our foreign service consists of over 40% women. That is quite unusual. However, in the private sector, the number of women in decision-making positions is still small. While several European Union member countries, also Iceland and Norway, have adopted uh, legislation to increase the number of female board members. In Liechtenstein, there are very few at this level. In my opinion, the equal representation of women and men in all areas of decision making is not just an issue of equality between men and women, but one of human rights, democracy, and economic efficiency. The story of Liechtenstein itself is quite remarkable, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit so you, you know where I'm coming from, because the topic today is not Liechtenstein, but women in politics. So just a few basic facts. Um, most of you may have had time to Google us. We are a small country, the, small, the fourth smallest in Europe between Switzerland and Austria comparable in size to the District of Columbia, namely 62 square miles, two-thirds of which are mountains. We are an independent country since 1806, but we have been in existence as a principality since almost 300 years. Our state form is that of a monarchy, a constitutional monarchy on a democratic and parliamentary basis. We are a um, economically successful country. We have uh, pretty much full employment. We have um, a manufacturing industry that generates 40% of our GDP. And we have uh, financial services, which is the second pillar of our economy, at 27%, and then another 27% general services. And agriculture has gone down to 8%. When I entered government service, and I, I am in my 40th year, 4-0, there were no female role models in my country, no female mentors. And I know that it would have helped me very much to be inspired by having female leaders around me. I'm therefore of the firm belief it is my and our duty as professional women to be mentors for younger colleagues. 
how do I accomplish this? I have um, at any given time at least one intern in my small embassy. Very often those interns happen to be young women. They either come from Liechtenstein or from any of the universities in and around Washington. I do stay in touch with many of them. I try to accompany as many as possible into their professional life. I write letters of recommendation. I try to connect them if they wish so. And um, I sometimes also, if I'm asked, uh, give advice when it comes to, to personal life because uh, there is just a lot to be shared, and uh, I, I really take great joy and pleasure in doing that. I grew up in a society where the public and the private roles of men and women were a given. I did not have the opportunity to get a higher education. I have no academic credentials to offer. However, I consider myself very fortunate to have lived in what is called in this country the American dream. Well, I am living the Liechtenstein dream. I have had wonderful, wonderful opportunities. I may have been at the right time at the right place, but also I am a product of a time when my country underwent a transformation from being a country of farmers, a poor country, into what is today a highly successful country with a thriving manufacturing industry and a thriving financial center. When I am in, a academic back, in an academic environment like this, I'm always, well, very grateful and very humbled. And more often than not, also today, I would just simply like to stay and be a student as, yeah rather than going back to Washington, which, don't get me wrong, I love very much. I was given opportunities that I took, and I was given opportunities that I looked for. I had very supportive parents, and for the longest time, a very supportive husband, and that helped a lot. But I also remember looking back, and I have come a long way. I remember meetings where I know I should have spoken up, and I didn't. I remember encounters where I'm, I was not as assertive as I would be today. So learning by doing, that is how my career developed. Not my choice, but it worked. I'd like to say now a few words because everybody who encounters uh, uh, an ambassador from uh, a foreign country is probably interested to know what are the issues that the United States has with Liechtenstein. Is there anything at all? Do we have anything in common? Are there any common interests? Well, I have to say that in Pretty much every respect, uh, the last 12 years in terms of bilateral relations have been marked by an increased cooperation between the US and Liechtenstein in a number of financial issues. That includes our cooperation in combating money laundering, terrorist financing, tax fraud, tax evasion. Those are all topics that uh, use not to be my expertise, but they have become, so I have learned a lot. And today, after a transformation period of about, about 10 years, pretty much, Liechtenstein is a very transparent financial center, and it adheres to the highest standards defined by the OECD. And we have come from a period where a lot of times people would refer to us as an opaque financial center, we are today uh, one of the most cooperative and transparent financial centers. I had the great honor, as you have heard, to open our mission to the United Nations when we became a member in 1990. And I had again the opportunity to do, to do something that most diplomats never get the chance in a lifetime to do it, namely to open a second diplomatic representation, our embassy in Washington. 
as you can gather, I run one of the smallest, if not the smallest, operation in Washington. Um, having been there now for over 11 years, I have risen in seniority. I am presently number four. So there are only three colleagues who have served longer in Washington than I have. And uh, that, I have to say, gives Liechtenstein uh, occasionally a visibility that we couldn't pay a lobbying firm to give us. Amongst the 180 or so uh, embassies, there are presently 28 female ambassadors. We pretty much you know we all know each other, uh, which is not to be taken for granted in Washington. Washington is a very competitive place. In Washington, you don't build alliances. You don't get together with the ambassadors of your region. Uh, we pretty much all, we run our own show. We have been sent to Washington by our respective governments to achieve the best possible access, the best possible network, the highest visibility. And this is something that we all have to do individually. We cannot really work together a great deal. There are exceptions. Uh, to my knowledge, the African countries, their ambassadors meet regularly. Uh, the European Union ambassadors, we are not a member, meet once a month. And Washington is not the place where you forge regional alliances. Washington is the place where you, your country, focuses on the host country, and that's the United States. When it comes to our multilateral engagement, and I'm now referring in particular to the UN, Liechtenstein has taken a specific interest in human rights, and in particular in supporting initiatives that promote the right of women, the rights of women and women's empowerment. Our most pronounced engagement in this respect is at the UN, where we have put a special emphasis on women, peace, and security. Why? We believe that the situation of women and girls in conflict areas, in conflict-affected societies, deserves special attention. Women and children continue to account for the majority of those adversely affected by armed conflict. Women and children constitute some 80% of all refugees and internally displaced people worldwide. They are threatened by deprivation of property, goods and services, and their rights to return to their home, and also by violence and insecurity. Women and girls are also increasingly targeted by combatants. Violations of the human rights of women in conflict situations are violations of the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law and human rights. Together with a group of like-minded countries, Liechtenstein has been advocating within the UN for many years an increased role of women in preventive diplomacy, peace building, and conflict resolution. This includes the appointment of women as special representatives and special envoys of the UN Secretary General, because we are convinced that such appointments can play a catalytic role for the stronger involvement of women in peace processes. We consider such appointments crucial for a better implementation for the groundbreaking Security Council Resolution 1325. This resolution is the first ever decision by the UN Security Council, and that is the only organ of the UN which can take binding decisions for all member countries to address the disproportionate and unique impact of armed conflict on women. It recognizes the undervalued and underutilized contributions women can make to conflict prevention, peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and peace building, and it stresses the importance of their equal and full participation as active agents of peace and security. Let me tell you what we have done at the UN in practical terms to promote this cause. Along with partners, amongst them our neighboring country Switzerland, we provide part of the financing and we helped uh, develop the concept of monthly action points. These are uh, designed to help the Security Council with specific recommendations on how to better integrate the obligations derived 
from the Women, Peace and Security agenda into its specific daily work. Also, it was Switzerland with whom we partnered to support the publication of a handbook on Women, Peace and Security, and this assists in addressing the rights of women when designing and renewing mandates for UN missions, including peacekeeping missions. We also have de developed an iPhone app in close cooperation with our NGO partners, and this iPhone app is now in use in, I'm happy to say, in most conflict areas. This is a big, big step forward. We are an active member in the informal pressure group, such as the group of the Friends of Women, Peace and Security, which consists of almost 50 like-minded countries from various regions in the world. Last but not least, we support initiatives related to safe access to cooking fuel and firewood. It is unfortunately a well-known fact that women and girls in conflict areas are often the, vic the victims of sexual violence when walking long distances to gather firewood. When Secretary Clinton, then Secretary Clinton, in December 2011 presented the U.S. National Action Plan to implement the Resolution 1325, she did so at Georgetown University in Washington. I am happy that this university is now home to the Institute, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security within its School of Foreign Service. And my embassy cooperates with the Institute. Uh, we have regular meetings and the Institute's executive, executive director is Melan Ferveer, who was until about a year ago the ambassador at large for global women's issues. Let me now say a few words about a very important convention, CEDA. It's the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It is the International Bill of Rights for Women, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly already in 1979. This piece of work, and it is, it's relevant when it comes to promoting women's empowerment. I mention this convention because I want to point out that major treaties, major international treaties, regardless of whether they are signed and ratified by all or only partly the UN members, they are always a work in progress. But without them, we lack standards which guide our behavior as individuals and as governments. This is an issue that is fundamentally important whether you are a small nation like Liechtenstein or a superpower like the United States. Please bear in mind, I represent a country that has no armed forces. We abolished our army in 1868. We have no defense agreement with our neighboring countries. Our only defense is if the rest of the world respects international law and the rule of law. And you have to see our uh, multilateral, our international engagement against that background. So therefore, sustaining an environment that provides for security, stability, and cooperation, and within which the rule of law and the respect for human rights prevails, has been a priority of the people and the government of Liechtenstein for many years. Helping to sustain such an environment on a larger, more global scale is something that we in Liechtenstein feel we can and want to con contribute to. On that note, since I am a firm believer in, uh, in an interactive dialogue, I want to end my presentation. I would love to get your comments. I, of course, would be very pleased if you have any questions. And uh, I just hope that I have covered a little bit of ground and the rest I can cover through your questions and comments. Thank you.